During the Cold War, top secret military facilities appeared to be magnets for UFO sightings. Why? You've got this apparent interest in our technology. Is it the Soviets or is it something else? The fact that it's unexplained doesn't mean it's extraterrestrial. It just means the U just means unidentified. That's it. Declassified military documents reveal stunning eyewitness reports. That appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. But is that enough to prove anything? Eyewitness testimony isn't all that, that reliable. And in fact, in science, it's about the worst kind of evidence possible. Damn it, why did they plan that? Stop, 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 stop. The speculation continues. It's kind of the British Roswell. Could it have been extraterrestrial? I can't rule that out. Was it paranoia-fueled misperception, hoax, or truly unknown? Christmas night, 1980. Security personnel on a NATO Air Force base notice something is wrong. 100 miles northeast of London, two RAF bases sit side by side. Woodbridge and Bentwaters. They are separated by a wooded area known as Rendlesham Forest. During the Cold War, the British bases are operated by the US Air Force. Airman First Class John Burroughs and Sergeant Bud Steffens are patrolmen of the Air Force Police. Sergeant Steffens, who was driving the vehicle, noticed some strange lights in the forest. According to their report, this is how the night unfolds. There were strange, like, white lights. The two patrolmen head outside of the base into the adjoining forest to investigate. When Burroughs gets out of the car, he immediately notices something unusual. There was like a static electricity in the air. Something just didn't feel right. He says, yeah, let's get out of here. Let's get back up to the gate. Burroughs and Stephens head back to the base. They need authorization before they can investigate further. I jumped out, went into the gate shack, and picked up the phone. The shift commander got confirmation that something was over the area that disappeared off a radar. Woodbridge Central Security Command alerts the Suffolk police that troops are investigating what they call a UFO. This is the beginning of a three-night stretch of strange events. Staff Sergeant Jim Penniston and Airman Edward Cabansag are assigned to join Burroughs. Their orders investigate unidentified lights in Rendlesham Forest. As we were driving down, you could still see the, the light in the forest. We eventually got to the point where the truck couldn't go any further, and we stopped. Stop, 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 stop. We dismounted the vehicle, the three of us. We followed the lights into the forest. So the adrenaline was pumping, and we just spread out. More than 30 years later, John Burroughs retraces his steps in Rendlesham Forest. This is where Sergeant Pennison and myself and Airman Kambanzak were. We came up over the burn. All of a sudden, there it was. This whole area, this whole area was just lit up almost like daylight. And then that's when we hit the ground. Burroughs, Penniston, and Cabanseg don't know what they've just seen. But their entire story is nothing more than a story, compelling but not supported by any hard evidence. UFO sightings are by definition unidentified, so we don't know what they are. Dr. Roger Lanius is an associate director at the National Air and Space Museum. Many times, uh, we tend to leap to conclusions about these sorts of things, and clearly they can be any number of things. But given the military sensitivity of the area, the Rendlesham story triggered an investigation. 
Early the next morning, base personnel and local police went to the area of the sighting. They combed the scene and reported three strange indentations in the soil. In the Rendlesham Forest, which is near some British air bases, I've actually been there, there were claims that they had found something strange going on. There were lights in the sky, maybe aircraft, maybe people touched them, maybe they didn't touch them. Seth Shostak is the lead astronomer for the SETI Institute, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It's kind of the British Roswell. Like the Roswell incident in America, Shostak thinks the Rendlesham Forest incident in Britain has been built into a legend that has overtaken logic. There seems to be a pretty strong connection between military bases and UFO activities, as if the aliens have a lot of interest in our military facilities. They're buzzing our silos or, or something like that. Doesn't make any sense to me. Any society that could come here is, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of years more advanced than we are. Their interest in our military sounds like me spending all my time going back to the Roman Empire and looking at the places where they make their, their spears. Despite Shostak's skepticism, he looks for alien civilizations for a living. The SETI Institute uses a large array of radio dishes to scan the sky. We can certainly see space from Earth, but can we hear it? Our project, SETI, is designed to find out if there's anybody out there in space that's not just alive, not just biology, but intelligent. So we try and uh, eavesdrop on radio signals that they might be broadcasting our way. No matter what we think the chances might be, we don't know how many societies are out there waiting to be found. Shostak is an astronomer, but also an ambassador of sorts. He is in constant demand for media interviews. So where are you looking at the moment? Well, at the moment, we still look at the nearby stars that are pretty much like the sun. Shostak knows that one of the fundamental questions of humanity is, who else is out there? That question has created a universe of stories books, TV shows, movies, that show the infinite creativity of the human imagination. But while the search for aliens is fascinating to ponder, Shostak wants it to be fundamentally rooted in science, not stories. Look, I'm not against mysterious phenomena. You know, this idea, and you hear this a lot, particularly from people who are you know, convinced that UFOs represent alien visitation. You scientists are so close-minded, you won't you won't look at this evidence. You don't like the idea of mysteries. Well, that's crazy. That's exactly what scientists are interested in. Of course we're interested in mysteries. So the only question is, is there really a mystery here? Or is it something that, in fact, if you looked at it deeply, you would find that, well, there actually isn't any mystery. It's just a bunch of phenomena that are perfectly prosaic. But some thought the phenomena of UFO sightings at nuclear facilities deserved more investigation. In the early 1990s, Nick Pope was an employee of the British government's Ministry of Defense. One of his duties was to investigate UFO phenomena and determine any potential threats to national defense. The vast majority of sightings were easily explainable, but a few remain riddles to Nick Pope. During my time on the Ministry of Defense's UFO project, it was clear to me that the Rendlesham Forest incident was Britain's most significant and compelling UFO case. More than a decade after the sighting, he investigated the Rendlesham files, including the theory that something landed, though no photos of any landing evidence have ever surfaced. The three indentations, when plotted out, formed a triangle shape. What is this object? Is it the Soviets, or is it something else? It is 1980. World politics is dominated by two competing superpowers, the US and the Soviet Union. And the fault line between them runs through the heart of Europe. On the English North Sea coast, the twin bases Woodbridge and Bentwaters are within striking distance if the Soviets invade Western allies. So any report of a violation of NATO airspace would be taken very seriously. I think that the Cold War is probably responsible for a lot of our attitudes toward UFOs because, you know, after the Second World War, we were worried about, of course, <laughs> 
bombers from the Soviet Union and so forth. So watching the skies was something that you had to do for survival. Everybody was worried about this threat from above. And I think that that did influence our attitudes toward unknown objects seen in the skies. Less than a week after their unusual experience, Burroughs, Penniston, and Cabansag were required to write statements. Detailed witness statements were taken from the key participants. These declassified documents from the U.S. Air Force archives are first-person accounts of the events from that night. The whole area just turned white. We all hit the ground. I would have been in the center. Ed would have been to my right. Jim would have been to my left. The eyewitnesses were instructed to sketch their version of events. I also drew what the object looked like to me, how I perceived it. Red light, sunlight had white light coming out from underneath it and blue lights mixed in with it. The three statements were consistent. Blue, red, white, and yellow lights. Sergeant Penniston's statement includes his judgment that the object was definitely mechanical in nature. Could this have been uh, classified US technology in one way or another? Author and UFO researcher Richard Dolan has studied the case in depth. Could it have been a falling satellite, like some people have said? No, I don't think it could at all have been a falling satellite. At all. How does that explain what happened in the forest? The Russians? No, not really. I mean, there's just no evidence. There's no reason to think that this was Russian technology. Skeptics think this lack of evidence is OK, as long as people don't try to fill the void with alien visitation theories. Because we can't explain everything. Michael Shermer is a science author and publisher of Skeptic Magazine. What ufologists do, they take those handful of little anomalies, like, see, it wasn't Venus, it wasn't swamp gas, it wasn't a, the Air Force wasn't there, so it has to be an alien. No, it doesn't have to be anything. It can just be, I don't know what it is. Some believe the bizarre events at Bentwaters may have a simple explanation. The mistaken observations of men in a situation of extreme stress. During the 1980s, there was a heightened sense of that possibility of nuclear annihilation. Cold War tension may have influenced the perceptions of the men at Rendlesham. One of the things that we've seen in the Cold War, uh, as it ebbed and flowed, uh, is sort of heightened awareness. And I think when you have that heightened awareness, you tend to be more cautious and you see certain things. And eyewitness reports in any environment are easily challenged. Eyewitness reports are the backbone of our justice system, but as has been demonstrated many times, they are not necessarily what actually took place. We got lights over Rendlesham Forest. For two more nights, the strange lights return to the twin NATO air bases near Rendlesham. No documentation for the second night sighting has ever surfaced. The third night was different. This time, senior officers were involved. Deputy Base Commander Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt was a first-hand witness. He decided to go to the clearing where Burroughs and Penniston had had their encounter on the first night. Halt's intention is to defuse this whole situation. Rumors about the UFO sightings have been sweeping the base. So Holt wants to go out here and debunk this whole UFO nonsense. While there is still no photographic evidence of that night, there is an audio recording. Colonel Holt habitually carried with him a small handheld cassette recorder. 150 feet or more from the initial, I should say, suspected impact point. That night in Rendlesham Forest, Colonel Halt recorded a startling event in real time. But was it real? There is no doubt about it. This is weird. Colonel Halt and his men are trying to identify the lights in Rendlesham Forest near two military bases. We got lights over Rendlesham Forest. Anyone see it? One reason for the extreme caution. The bases were rumored to be hiding places for nuclear weapons. There was absolutely no tolerance for a security breach. There have been a number of allegations over the years that nuclear weapons were kept at Bentwaters and or Woodbridge. 
But it was not the first time UFOs were reported around secret nuclear facilities. In the 1940s, Los Alamos was ground zero. It was the real center for uh, U.S. nuclear technology. Los Alamos, New Mexico, is the legendary birthplace of the atomic bomb. Here, the greatest minds of 20th century science crack the atom and unleash the power of nuclear fission. An FBI document reveals one strange event that raised concern. December 1948, University of New Mexico. Astronomer Lincoln La Paz reports witnessing a green fireball from his lab in Albuquerque. He triangulates his observations with other eyewitnesses. He predicts it is heading towards Los Alamos. An unknown object was tracked going at an unbelievable speed. At one of America's most secret facilities, anything strange in the sky caused a reaction. So out of caution and curiosity, the US government commissioned Dr. La Paz to study the phenomena at Los Alamos. Other eyewitnesses agreed with La Paz, reporting that the object appeared as if controlled. Subsequent research and debate never fully explained the fireballs. Some thought it was a craft, others thought it was a natural phenomenon. But all agreed it was mysterious at a time when mystery and tension ruled global politics. During the Cold War, nuclear secrecy was the order of the day. Any perceived security breach at a military facility was serious business. Duck and cover. Apprehension and sometimes paranoia pervaded both the armed forces and the general public. Duck and cover under the table. Then such a mentality could have shaped perceptions of any UFO eyewitnesses in 1940s Los Alamos or 1980s Great Britain. At Rendlesham Forest, Sergeant Jim Penniston reported something he believed to be definitely mechanical in nature. Some thought that an entity, foreign or alien, was spying. If nuclear weapons were secretly stored at Bentwaters and Woodbridge bases, the heightened secrecy and watchfulness could have caused an overreaction to a strange phenomenon. But the story was about to get even stranger. On the third night of the incident, Colonel Charles Halt led a group into the woods, tape recorder in hand. There is no question whatsoever about the authenticity of this tape. But there are many mysteries about the story on the tape. Nick Pope thinks the men did see something. This audio tape is a key piece of evidence and documents exactly what Holt and the other men saw. This is strange. Here, someone want to look at this monster the ground? Holt's team came equipped with Geiger counters to detect anomalous radiation levels. An abrasion or something in the ground where the pine needles are all pushed back when we get a high uh, reading. So there's a positive after five? Yes, there is definitely. Halt and his men observed damage to the trees at the suspected landing site. Looking directly overhead, one can see an opening in the trees, plus some freshly uh, broken pine branches on the ground underneath. But also there seemed to be burn marks, scorch marks on the sides of some of the trees around the clearing. You've got a definite heat reflection off the tree, about, about three to four feet off the ground. Hey, this is eerie. There are these, these peaks in radiation levels in the three indentations and on the faces of the, the trees. And at that point, it becomes a reality for Holt because somebody calls out, sir, it's back, look there, through the trees. Right at this position here. Oh, yeah, I see it too. What is it? It's a strange, small red light. There's no doubt about it. There's some type of strange flashing red light ahead. Yeah, it's yellow. I saw a yellow tinge in it too. Weird. Let's move out to the edge of the clearing so we can get a better look at it. Halt's team moved forward. They really don't know what to make of this thing. Yeah, we're heading about 110, 120 degrees from the site out through to the clearing now. Still getting a reading on the meter, about two clicks. But there's a point where they realize it's actually coming closer. 
And it's like, it's coming this way. way. It is definitely coming this way. This is weird. If you listen to that tape, you can hear the tension and the fear in those men's voices. It starts off as, as just a, a light in the distance. I'm observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. Was this uh, communication? Was this a weapon? Was this a warning? What was this? The story of the mysterious light created a lot of fascinating questions, but it cannot create much of a scientific case. This is a great story. It's fascinating. But we know from research that you know eyewitnesses, eyewitness accounts are not reliable. Mine's not any better than yours. And you know, so we have to actually have physical evidence, uh, or else we don't really have a case. There's also a tendency to assume that people of higher military rank somehow have higher powers of perception. There's this fascination amongst ufologists that the higher the rank you are in the military, the better you are at perceiving things. But what they're looking for is credibility. And somehow the general has more credibility than the sergeant, who has more credibility than the average citizen standing there. But, but in reality, to scientists, it doesn't make any difference. Credible or not, when stories are similar, they become connected. UFO researchers compared the Rendlesham story with others like it, including one from America. So it's late October 1975. It's late at night. You're at Loring Air Force Base, northern Maine, and an unknown something is being tracked coming toward the base. Loring was one of over 50 strategic air command bases. Most had nuclear weapons. Few had any UFO sightings. But when they did, UFO researchers took notice. Unidentified aircraft who are flying in restricted airspace. A report from that night states that the unidentified object was at an altitude of 150 feet and was sighted near the weapons storage area. The sighting lasted almost two hours. Identify yourself, over. But when a National Guard helicopter attempted to intercept it, the pilot saw nothing. Despite the report that it hovered over the Air Force Base for two hours, it was never intercepted, filmed, or photographed. It's reported again the next night at the exact same time. So you've got this case where this something comes in, it hangs out for a certain period of time, and then it goes away. And again, this is a pattern. UFO investigators were drawing connections between the sightings in America and Britain, and saying that nuclear weapons were the bait. We've got this apparent interest by whoever is behind this phenomenon in our technology. While these sightings were compelling, they were not abnormal. UFOs were reported no more frequently at nuclear sites than they were anywhere else. But military security and sensitivity gave them an air of espionage. We got lights over Rendlesham Forest. Even without hard evidence, it could have been a dangerous breach of security. Officials had to assume the threat was real. And for one eyewitness, it is about to get personal. It's coming this way. It is definitely coming this way. It's your pieces are off. There is no doubt about it. This is weird. This is the third night of sightings near Bentwaters Air Base in 1980. Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt is trying to get to the bottom of the mystery with a tape recorder in hand. Well, I'm sorry, but it appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. The Air Force cordons off the forest to military personnel only. Off-duty patrolman John Burroughs, who witnessed the first night's events, rushes to the scene. When I got out here, I found out there was already a group of people out in the forest doing an investigation. Burroughs requests permission to join Halt's investigation. Myself and one other airman were allowed to proceed forward out into the field and meet up with Colonel Halt's party. Halt and his men are on their way back to the base to report what they've seen. When I met up with Colonel Halt, he turned and pointed out towards what would have been Bentwater's base. And at that point, I could see a blue light, which appeared to be flying around in the sky. With Halt's permission, 
Burroughs and Sergeant Adrian Bastinza move forward. What happens next is the story they came back with. As the two men move toward the object, Sergeant Bastinza falls to the ground. He felt something actually pushed him down to the ground and held him to the ground. I looked up and it appeared like the object was almost on top of us at that point. Burroughs is mesmerized by the intense light. Everything seemed like we were in slow motion. And the next thing I know, the object was gone. For John Burroughs, what happens next is a total mystery. I have no memory from how I got back from the field all the way up till Sunday night, which would have been about 14 hours where I don't remember how I got home or where I was. According to Burroughs, Colonel Halt summoned him and the other eyewitnesses to file their reports. When we were asked to write the report, I was told just to write a, a brief summary on the first night while we went out there. Colonel Holt wanted this whole situation to go away. He wanted to forget the whole thing and put it behind him. Holt describes this whole subject as being not career enhancing. Burroughs claims that Holt ordered him to limit his report to the first night and omit the rest. Only Holt reported on the third night, which remains the lone official document describing those events. The Holt memo is entitled Unexplained Lights, but clearly goes on to describe something which goes uh, over and above just lights in the sky. The low-key title is, I think, a deliberate attempt already at the outset to try and downplay this incident. Hope speculates that Holt's report could be describing an extraordinary event, but others think it may be a case of extraordinary imagination in reaction to a very ordinary light source. My feeling is that their original source of the UFO was the Norford Nest Lighthouse. Retired US Navy submariner Tim Printy is an amateur astronomer and UFO skeptic. The lighthouse was in the direction that the airmen went. The Orford Lighthouse is located six miles directly east of Rendlesham Forest. They went out the east gate they went into the woods. They ended up in a field. And in that field, you can see the Orford Lighthouse out in the distance. Police documents back Printy's hypothesis. During their investigation, they state, the only lights visible to the attending officers were those visible from the Orford Lighthouse. I saw y'all attention at two. And the only physical evidence of the night, Halt's audio tape, appears to support Printy's theory. On the tape, that Colonel Halt made, you get a time sequence on there. And it's every five seconds, that's the same rotation rate in which the lighthouse at Orford Ness flashes its light. On the recording, Colonel Halt's reactions appear to line up with the five second interval of the rotating light. Straight ahead, from between the tree, there it is again. Watch, straight ahead off my flash right there. So there it is, hey, I see it too. Unfortunately, the Orford Lighthouse is now decommissioned, so no further analysis can be done. The stories of Halt and Burroughs may never be fully explained, but for another eyewitness, the story goes far beyond strange lights. Larry Warren is one of the most controversial figures in the Rendlesham story. He was an Air Force security specialist at the time of the UFO event. On the night in question, I was involved. That is the night Charles Holt made his audio tape. Larry Warren has returned to RAF Bentwaters for the first time in over 30 years. Wow. His account of what happened on the third night is far stranger than anything Burroughs and Holt have said so far. We're at the end of the Bentwaters runway. On this runway, on that night, Warren was on guard at the east end of Bentwaters base. Got lights over Reynolds Forest. I started to hear the talk about lights being seen in the direction of Woodbridge. Can you say tower, visual confirmation, unidentified lights over forest. I get a call from Central Security Control saying, deactivate your post. Lieutenant England is going to be pulling up to your post soon. So within 10 minutes, I had three other individuals in the back of the security police truck. 
Warren realizes they are driving into Rendlesham Forest towards the east gate of Woodbridge Base. And that's where everything, you know, took a turn for me. Warren arrives at Operations Base Camp and is immediately ordered to investigate the forest. I saw lights at a distance. At first, nothing seems out of the ordinary to Warren. Everything was normal. I thought it was an exercise, a training exercise. But it got weird, and it got strange. Larry claims the bizarre phenomena that he saw was only the beginning of a mystery that became deeper and much darker. December 28th, 1980, the third night of UFO sightings outside Bentwaters Air Base. U.S. Air Force Security Specialist Larry Warren is cautiously making his way through Rendlesham Forest. This is the middle of the night now, two nights after the initial contact. Warren and the security detail are directed to a clearing in the woods. There was a massive uh, static electric charge in the forest. You can feel the hair on your arms. It was an energy thing that was all over you. Warren claims to have entered the clearing. In this field was a mist on the ground. It was 50 foot in diameter. It wasn't hovering above it. It was like a fog. His recollections go beyond anyone else's reports. The cameras now would be behind me off to the right, right over here filming this thing, this glowing fog. That was the axis where the commanders came in, right over here. Above that stand of trees, a red light appeared. And this red light came in, and it did a downward arc over this field, 20 feet above this mist on the ground, and detonated. And exploded right instantly. And it flashed so bright that it was, uh, there was a moment of blindness. And then I was tapped out on the shoulder, head back to the vehicles. That night changed my life forever. I was one way when I got here. I was a total different person when I left this field. Warren's claims get even stranger. He says he saw extraterrestrials. But when people interpret strange lights as spaceships, or even aliens themselves, skeptics ask for more than a story. They ask for evidence. With no physical evidence, really, accounts of uh, aliens or any other activity like that is automatically one that many people will be suspicious of. Scientists have studied how our imaginations can create memories we sincerely think are real. In the absence of facts, people are hardwired to supply an explanation for something that they've seen, heard, or experienced. Anybody can make conjectures about anything, and they do. Uh, it, it takes extra effort. It's a lot of work to actually devise a method to find out if it's actually true. Warren wrote a book detailing his experience, but he remains a lone voice in the Rendlesham Forest incident. No known document verifies his account. No other eyewitnesses reported anything like it. And some of them doubt Warren was even there. No footage from the cameras he said were nearby has ever surfaced. No photographs, no traces of a craft or residue from any explosions. There's no evidence that anything landed anywhere, let alone a spacecraft with passengers. But Larry Warren stands by his story, proof or no proof. Rendlesham is the most famous UFO incident near a weapons facility, but it is not the only one. Five years before, America experienced its own wave of weirdness. All through late October and early November of 1975, there were a number of US bases that were subject to violations of airspace by unknown objects. And one of them was Fort Smith Air Force Base. According to the report, a tower guard claimed to see an unidentified craft descending over the base. A military airplane was dispatched to investigate.
And what ensued is this very bizarre cat and mouse chase. The people operating the aircraft are thinking, are we following one object or two objects? And they couldn't really tell. When military rank and file saw strange things during the Cold War, it's not surprising that officials tried to find out what they were. But at that time, a military base may not have been the best place for a transparent scientific investigation. The Cold War was defined by classified programs, top secret tests, and trust no one security procedures. Strange sightings at the most sensitive bases caused alarm and perhaps confusion. Certainly uh, Cold War anxieties about secrets in general, particularly nuclear weapons, uh, would probably play into this in the sense that uh, nobody actually knows everything that's going on. You know, the higher up you go in terms of military secrets, government secrets, the less you actually know about what other people know, and they don't know about what you know. And consequently, where there are secrets, well, who knows what could be going on. The thing is that a lot of things do happen near military bases involving aircraft that you don't know about because they're not landing at your local airport. So I think that the connection is mostly that, if not entirely that. But at the time, reports of anything unusual were taken seriously. The sightings near the British bases involved some American personnel. And that drew a visit from an American general the most senior United States Air Force officer in Europe personally flew in to be briefed about this. In a declassified memo dated February 16th, 1981, a senior RAF officer stated that General Charles Gabriel, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Air Force in Europe, flew into Bentwaters. The fact that General Gabriel visited the base and was briefed on this incident shows that this was taken seriously at the very highest levels within the US military. And General Gabriel could have had a perfectly rational reason for being on base. Tim Printy has an opposing theory. There may have been a concern on his part as to his personnel actually going out into British territory on unauthorized visits in uh, uniform. People are going to be concerned about that. Why is the US military walking around in my backyard? Something bizarre was happening at Bentwaters. It's coming this way. And Colonel Halt is about to come forward 30 years later. The strange phenomena at Bentwaters Air Base. We got lights over Reynolds from Forest. Have been described as everything from a UFO landing to the flashes of a nearby lighthouse. Rank and file men like Burroughs and Warren continue to recount their version of events. But what about the officer in command on the third night? Colonel Halt maintains public silence about his experiences and has refused television interviews for nearly a decade. Nick Pope interviewed Colonel Halt privately on this subject. Halt felt strongly that something unexplained happened that night. Colonel Halt felt extremely angry and frustrated by the way in which unmarked aircraft were flying in. Finally, Halt ended his silence. In 2010, he signed a notarized affidavit offering his recollection of the night he had recorded on audio tape 30 years earlier. Halt states that he believes the objects he saw were extraterrestrial in origin. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. Why would the military try to downplay these mysterious events at the time? It may have been, for a very timely reason, global tension with the Soviet Union. We're in the War Operations Center at Bentwaters. In the event of a nuclear war or incident, this room would have played a key role. The base's war room infrastructure signaled just how much the Cold War drove the mindset at Bentwaters and could have driven people to misperceptions. The months leading up to the Rendlesham Forest incident were an unstable period of the Cold War. The Soviet Union had invaded Afghanistan just one year earlier. They were also considering military intervention in Poland, where a growing solidarity movement threatened the Soviet grip on power. 
the U.S. had boycotted the 1980 Summer Olympics in Moscow. Then, Ronald Reagan was elected president on a platform of strengthening the military to better face down Soviet aggression. The delicate balance between superpowers was teetering dangerously. And any base with nuclear weapons felt the tension. But did Bentwaters have nuclear weapons? At that time, governments did not typically disclose where they were storing them. When asked directly, Nick Pope refuses to speak openly. I served for 21 years in the Ministry of Defense, and I signed the Official Secrets Act on my very first day. It binds me for life. I must neither confirm nor deny any of the stories and rumors about nuclear weapons here. But at the time, Larry Warren suspected what history has since revealed. We're at the uh, entrance uh, to Hot Row right here. And it's called a Hot Row because of radiac material and the ordinance, nuclear ordinance. So it's hot nuke. Frankly, no one would talk about the nukes here on the base or anything. Of course, the military didn't announce the location of its weapons. But for those working on the base, it was hardly a secret. I worked in here one night as a shadow for a cop. And I had a lot explained to me about what was here. We had a huge backline storage of tactical nuclear weapons. A report from the environmental watchdog Natural Resources Defense Council supports Larry Warren's claim of nuclear weapons at Bentwaters. Their research suggests that until 1986, RAF Bentwaters was a storage facility for nuclear bombs with a capacity of 100 nuclear warheads. Despite the government's neither confirm nor deny stance on the nuclear rumors, Lord Hill Norton, a former chief of the defense staff and a five-star admiral, has been rather more outspoken. In a 1997 letter asking for an investigation into Colonel Halt's claims, Hill Norton appeared to confirm that Bentwaters was nuclear armed. Ministers and the Ministry of Defense in particular saying that nothing that took place that December night in Suffolk is of defense interest. It simply isn't true. For Hill Norton, the events at the twin bases were an embarrassing breach of military security at a secret weapons facility. But whether that breach was real or imagined, human or alien, remains in the realm of opinion. Colonel Charles Halt is on record saying he believes the objects were extraterrestrial in origin. There is no doubt about it. This is weird. Richard Dolan believes the bases were hiding nukes, which could have attracted interest from somewhere. Look, if you're an intelligence that's monitoring the Earth, and you're seeing the native species blow up one nuclear bomb after another, after another, after another in these tests all over the planet. You might find it interesting, and you might even be a little bit concerned about what these, these natives are doing. Tim Prenti has doubts about them both. The energy released in a nuclear explosion, while very devastating locally, is relatively insignificant when you're observing from space. If you're on the moon, you probably wouldn't even notice. Radiation falls off with distance. In other words, the further you are away, the fainter it gets. Many scientists point out that the power of nuclear weapons would be trivial to hypothetical aliens that have mastered faster than light space travel to get to Earth in the first place. The UFO nuclear connection is tempting to make, but it is not supported by statistics. UFO sightings were no more common at nuclear facilities than anywhere else. But when bizarre happenings were reported near such facilities, a lack of evidence created a vacuum, and people will always try to fill it up with theories. UFO as a phenomenon is a fascinating area to look at from a cultural perspective. We love the things that are unexplained and seemingly unexplainable. Remember always that the, the fact that it's unexplained doesn't mean it's extraterrestrial. It just means the you just means unidentified. That's it. It isn't good enough to just tell me you think it's true. I mean, I'm going to ask you, so what are the data? What's the evidence? In fact, if the evidence were better, you'd have thousands and thousands of uh, academics 
beavering away on this problem. I mean, there, there's nothing that would be more interesting than to show that we're being visited. Uh, I'm not against the idea. I'd love the, if it was true. I think it would be the most spectacular discovery of all time, certainly. But the continued lack of evidence for visitations here is a sign that they probably haven't come here. Rumors flew and stories grew. Over 30 years later, it's still fascinating, but time usually reveals the truth. It is possible to keep secrets for you know a few decades anyway, but at some point it comes out and we find out what happened. Never have we discovered, finally, once and for all, oh yes, there is a, an alien spacecraft, there it is. That has never happened.